The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. This is an image of Sergeant Ken Kasakowitz crying as he learns the identity of the soldier in the body bag next to him. It's 20-year-old Private Andy Allen is. He was a close friend of Kasakowitz's during the Gulf War in 1991. This image was taken by David C. Turnley and titled The Face of War. He would be approached by Parade Magazine and this image would run on the front cover. This image embarrassed Sergeant Kazakowitz. He would attempt to avoid all interviews and interest that this image brought to him. He quietly faded into the background, and he never wanted to speak to Private Allen as his widow. 24 years later, he would be approached by the Buffalo News to ask about his life and ultimately set up a meeting between him and Private Allen as his family. The article provides new detail into what happened after and before the image was taken. He read the name on the dead soldier's identification card looked away from the bloody bag, and wailed. Kazakowicz, his broken left hand in a sling, had been guided into a medical evacuation helicopter after the Jaliba airfield route February 27, 1991. The battle was among the final objectives of a dominant campaign to expel Iraq dictator Saddam Hussein's army from the neighboring Kuwait. Kazakowicz and Corporal Mike Singargas were about to be whisked away. Then a body bag was loaded onto the helicopter floor. Kazakowicz demanded the dead soldier's name. A medic reluctantly handed Kazakowitz the ID for 20-year-old Private Andy Alanis. In the center of the photo, Sengarikas lifted his head bandages to glimpse the sack at his feet. I was just dumbfounded, Kazakowitz recalled Friday. I said, you've got to be kidding me. He just got married. There's no way. Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. The article then pivots to an interview of Catherine Alanis Simmons, the wife of Private Andy Alanis. She had this to say. I don't see my husband in a body bag. I see a man crying. I see my husband surrounded by people that loved him. This picture shows the true meaning of war. Not everybody came home. This is Tony Kurz. Born on January 13, 1913, in Bavaria, Germany, Tony and his childhood friend Andreas would garner national notoriety for being avid mountain climbers. Together, they would attempt some of the most difficult climbs at the time, one of those challenging ascents being Reiter Alp, a challenging mountain range located on the German-Austrian border. In July of 1936, Kurtz and Andreas sought out a new challenge. They wanted to ascend the north face of Eiger, one of many mountains on the Bernese Alps, located in Switzerland. While on the mountain, they met up with two Austrian climbers, Eddie Reiner and Willie Argener. The group of four chose to ascend the mountain together. Unfortunately, halfway through the ascent, Willie Argener was injured. The heat of the sun had loosened rocks on the north face of the mountain, making it hard for him to climb up the side. The rock struck him, and his injuries were critical. As a result, the team decided to descend the mountain. This would prove to be difficult. The group of four lost their route. They weren't sure which direction was the safest to descend the mountain. Gaining any visibility was a challenge as well. At some point during their descent, an avalanche was triggered, sweeping Andreas off the side of the mountain and disconnecting him from the group. The subsequent fall killed him instantly. After watching his childhood friend get thrown off the mountain, Tony Kurtz, Willie Argener, and Eddie Reiner attempted to get off the mountain as quickly as possible to limit further casualties. Willie Argener was climbing below Kurtz, and during the avalanche that swept Andreas off the mountain, was picked up by the wind and moving snow, and smashed against the side of the mountain, killing him instantly. Eddie Reiner was above Tony Kurz, and while everyone else below him were being tossed around by the avalanche, he was being slowly pressed against the mountain, leaving him with no room to breathe, and he would die minutes later of asphyxiation. Tony Kurz was the only one left alive, and was fortunately spotted by mountain guides. Unfortunately, they couldn't reach Kurz due to the severity of the storm, and they were forced to leave him dangling unprotected and exposed to the elements for the entire night. The next day, mountain guides attempted to effect a rescue, 
and Kurz himself made the effort, despite having a frozen hand due to losing a glove. To accomplish his own rescue, he had to cut loose the dead body of Willie Argener, who hung lifeless below him. Then he had to climb up to cut loose Eddie Reiner. He tied additional rope to himself in order to lower himself down. The mountain guides could only speak to him during the five hours it took to set himself up properly so he could be rescued. The mountain guides attempted to climb up to Reiner and grab the extra rope that he tied to himself. Unfortunately, when he made a sudden movement, the rope dropped leaving the team with less to work with, and as a result, the mountain guides had to combine two shorter ropes in order to reach the required length needed to save Tony. Tony reached for their rope, affixed it to himself, and began to descend. He stopped a mere couple of meters before the rescuer's knot because he didn't have enough strength. He had to release the tension of his own knot so it could pass through his gear to reach the mountain guides. He tried his hardest to move through the knot, but he exhausted himself. Facing the futility of his situation, he said only, I can't go on anymore. And he died. His body was later recovered by a German team. If you saw someone getting attacked, would you step in to stop it? Would you try to get help? Or would you just stand on the sidelines and watch? Aziz Hassan was born in 1998 in Pakistan, and on January 6, 2014, Aizaz was outside of his school's gate. He was standing with two other schoolmates, and Aizaz was not allowed to attend morning assembly due to his tardiness that day. While standing outside, he was allegedly approached by a 20 to 25 year old man who stated that he was there to take admission. One of the two students standing around him noticed a detonator on the man's chest. Whereas upon Aziz's schoolmates ran inside while Aziz confronted the suicide bomber who then detonated his vest. Aziz Hassan sacrificed his life for more than 2,000 students who were attending classes at that time. The school was renamed after him, the Aziz Hassan Shaheed High School, and the anniversary of his death is observed annually in Pakistan. During the aftermath of the tragedy, many news organizations picked up perspectives from different people who witnessed the event. According to other accounts, Aziz was on his way to school when he spotted a suspicious person. When Aziz tried to stop him, he started walking faster towards the school. In an attempt to stop the bomber, Aizaz threw a stone which failed to hit him. Then he ran towards the suicide bomber, prompting the suicide bomber to detonate his explosive laden vest. Even though perspectives vary, all of them draw the same conclusion, that Aizaz Hassan was a hero. And when his cousin was approached by media organizations to speak on Aizaz, he had this to say. My cousin sacrificed his life saving his school and hundreds of students and school fellows. The suicide bomber wanted to destroy the school and school students. It was my cousin who stopped him from this destruction. Aizaz Hassan was 15 years old. The Battle of Manila, otherwise known as the Manila Massacre, took place on the Philippine Islands and involved atrocities committed against Filipino citizens in the city of Manila. The Battle of Manila was a conflict between American soldiers and Japanese soldiers. The massacre began on February 3rd, 1945 and ended March 3rd, 1945. The United States Army was tasked in pushing Japan out of the islands, and capturing the city of Manila was a priority. During this month-long conflict, the U.S. Army made lots of progress in capturing the city. And during the lulls of battle, Japanese soldiers took out their frustrations on civilians of the city. Violent mutilations, sexual assault, and massacres occurred in schools, hospitals, and convents. This is an image of a Filipino survivor of the Manila Massacre. This image shows where a Japanese officer tried to behead this man. His neck is permanently scarred, and his head is forever left in a forward hunch, an everlasting reminder of the scariest and worst moment of this man's life. And it's a pensive thought that this man is one of the lucky ones. Between 100,000 and 500,000 innocent people died as a result of this conflict. This is Tiffany Ann Cole, born December 3rd, 1981. She was a friendly neighbor to Carol and Reggie Summer, an elderly couple who at the time no longer needed their car, so they chose to sell it to their friendly neighbor, Tiffany Cole. Tiffany would repay their courtesy 
in July of 2005, when she and her boyfriend Michael were staying at the Summers' home, early before they were just finishing up the paperwork to transfer the car into Tiffany's name. While that conversation was being had, her boyfriend was hatching a plan to rob the couple. Early the next month, in July 2005, the plan was put into action. Tiffany Cole, Michael, and two other men, Alan Wade and Bruce Nixon, drove to the Summers' home. Wade and Nixon went to the door and asked to use the phone. Once inside, Wade and Nixon attacked. The Summers were bound and gagged with duct tape. They were then placed inside the trunk of Tiffany's car, then driven across state borders into Georgia. Once there, the Summers were forced to reveal their personal identification numbers to their bank accounts. The couple, blindfolded and bound, were then pushed into a pre-dug grave and buried alive by Wade and Nixon. Tiffany would subsequently pawn off all jewelry and other stolen items from the Summers' home, and the ATM card was used to obtain more than $1,000 in cash. The group of three were traced back to a hotel in South Carolina by the use of the ATM card and arrested there. After being arrested, Nixon willingly led the police to the Summers' grave, revealing that both victims had managed to free themselves of their bonds but could only manage to hug each other in their final moments before they died. This shows Tiffany Cole and her two co-conspirators celebrating after robbing Carol and Reggie Summers. She's pictured drinking champagne and posing with the money that she and her boyfriend stole from the Summers bank account. They took this picture moments after they buried Carol and Reggie Summers alive. Five months after being arrested, Tiffany Cole would be handed two death sentences for the murders and the kidnappings. All co-conspirators except for Nixon received death sentences. They are currently awaiting execution at the Lowell Correction Institution in Annex. In this video series, we encounter a lot of disturbing and unsettling images, and a picture of a man smiling hardly falls into either category. I'm curious what comes to your mind when you look at an image like this. Do you see a man acting in polite courtesy? Just someone sharing their joy with another person? Maybe a candid photo of a funny moment that this man is having with someone just beyond the camera lens. This photo was taken by Alfred Eichenstadt in the fall of 1933. The subject of the photo is Josef Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda in Germany. It was Alfred's job to take candid or personal photos of all political figures that were attending the League of Nations session that day. Josef Goebbels was meant to be a sit-in for the Chancellor of Germany, and throughout the day Alfred took pictures of him. Josef Goebbels was unaware or unacquainted with Alfred, so he treated him like any other photographer that day, letting him capture as many images as he wanted. Alfred shadowed Goebbels that day following him and his bodyguards to each table in conversation, making sure to capture the best moments. The final image Alfred took of Josef Goebbels is the most infamous. It was taken at the exact moment he found out that Alfred was Jewish. Alfred Einstadt would go into detail in his 1985 book, Einstadt on Einstadt, a self-portrait, about the encounter with Josef Goebbels. I found him sitting alone at a folding table on the lawn of the hotel. I photographed him from a distance without him being aware of it. As a documentary reportage, the picture may have some value. It suggests his aloofness. Later, I found him at the same table surrounded by aisles and bodyguards. Goebbels seemed so small, while his bodyguards were huge. I walked up close and photographed Goebbels. It was horrible. He looked up at me with an expression full of hate. The result, however, was a much stronger photograph. There was no substitute for close personal contact and involvement with a subject. No matter how unpleasant it may be, he looked at me with hateful eyes and waited for me to wither. But I didn't wither. If I have a camera in my hand, I don't know fear. Hello, hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's video. A lot of you guys like this series, so I wanted to take my time on it, making sure we got some really good stories and really good posts. Sorry for the long wait for content. I know it's been like two weeks, so we're going to put out a whole bunch this week. And as always, got to thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. A big thank you to Light1636, Broken to Asters, Jackson, The Business, Lady Laps a Lot, Brett, Mina the Swift, Esau, Izuku, Destroyer, Trey, Muffy Lou Who, Noah, Vermont, John Robinson, Eva, Catherine Taylor, Arjun, Hannah. Anna, Keith Myers, Will Billy, Dustin, and Hostmar. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there is two links in the description, one of my Patreon and one of my merch store. Both funds go directly to the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. 
And as always, stay zesty.